This is the Sam Houston Tollway Bridge, an enormous crossing over Houston's vital ship channel. It carries well over 20 million people a year and is now the focus of a $1.5 billion effort to build two new cable stayed spans, doubling capacity from four lanes to eight. Yet despite these ambitions, it's become one of the most infamous bridge projects in the US after catastrophic design and engineering failures halted work for years and cost taxpayers almost $300 million. This is the controversial, compelling, and wild story of how the currently underway project failed and is staging an impressive comeback. January 7th, 2020, Harris County quietly ordered a complete stop to all construction of the bridge. It was a shocking and unexpected moment as news outlets, locals, and even the construction crews themselves were left questioning everything. But how did we get here? And what exactly happened? The crossing sits on the East Sam Houston Tollway, or Beltway 8, where it leaps the ship channel between the petrochemical complex and the east side of the metro. The original bridge opened in 1982 with four lanes and roughly 175 feet of airdraft, but it constrained both roadway capacity and maritime navigation. The replacement program answered those constraints with two parallel cable stayed bridges, one northbound and one southbound, each carrying four lanes plus shoulders. Over the water, the new main spans are designed as 1,320 foot free spans with about 188 feet of vertical clearance above mean high water and roughly 530 feet of horizontal opening. That geometry removes supports from the channel entirely while raising the navigational window for large vessels. The construction plan was as pragmatic as it was complex. Build the new southbound bridge next to the old one, then shift all traffic onto it and demolish the existing bridge. After, build the new northbound in the cleared footprint. That choreography keeps the tollway moving while maintaining ship traffic below. On paper, it's a straightforward set of steps. In the field, every small step is a project of its own. Construction kicked off in early 2018, and the bridges were initially expected to be completed by 2021 and 2024. Little did they know, everything was about to change. On March 15th, 2018, a pedestrian bridge on the edge of Florida International University's campus collapsed onto six lanes of traffic, killing six people. The cause of the failure was due to a miscalculation in resistance between the walkway surface and the truss that held it up, and the error was made by the firm Fig Bridge Engineers. Well, it just so happened that this same firm was the engineer of record for the main span of the project in Houston. In 2019, after some of the pedestrian bridge findings were released, and out of an abundance of caution, Harris County hired an independent checker, known as COE, to perform a full design verification. In the meantime, construction commenced as planned, at least until the auditor produced the review. The project in Harris County is on hold. The county is saying it's because of a design flaw in a crucial part of the bridge structure. To understand this review, think about how a cable stay bridge behaves as it's being built. Finished, the deck is supported by dozens of stay cables that fan back to tall pylons. The system is balanced and comparatively stiff. During construction, the deck grows outwards in segments from each pylon. In that half-built state, the structure is lighter and more flexible than it will be at completion. Wind matters more. Local details and stiffness at the pylons matter more, and any load you didn't include in your construction stage analysis shows up as reduced margin exactly when you want the most. Coey's report summarized 21 significant concerns, but three buckets tell most of the story. The first was wind. The project's wind loads, both for the finished bridge and during construction, were tied to wind tunnel recommendations. These recommendations relied on assumed dynamic properties, like the mass and stiffness distribution of the structure. Coey re-evaluated those dynamics with its own models, and and concluded that loads used in the calculations were substantially inaccurate. That's not a paperwork exercise. For a long, flexible, partially built span, the difference between two load models can be the difference between a design that works and one that doesn't. The second bucket was pylon capacity and detailing, specifically the curved kink regions of the main legs. Architecturally, the legs sweep and then straighten near the tower's mid-height. Structurally, that geometry concentrates stress. The review found that these kinked zones did not provide the required capacity, especially during demanding construction stages when forces don't yet balance across a closed system. In plain terms, the load path through the kink needed to be thicker, simpler, and more robust so that forces traveled exactly where the drawing said they would. The third bucket was foundations and staging. After rerunning analyses, Coey recommended updating the geotechnical capacities assumed for piles and ensuring pylon pile cap strength met requirements with comfortable margin. Just as important, 
important, the review flagged a construction stage analysis that did not include live traffic on the adjacent span during critical operation. Nobody argued that traffic would topple the bridge. The point was simpler. Omitting a real load consumes safety buffer. For century life infrastructure, you need to protect the buffer. With this in mind, and even a few other issues not mentioned, the county decided conclusively to order an immediate halt to all construction. FIG was removed from the project, with COE set to replace them and the contractor remaining in place. By November 2021, commissioners approved a $291 million contract amendment so the team could execute the updated design and staging. That pushed total construction costs, which started in the mid $800 million range, well over a billion. The new design centered on a very different superstructure strategy over the channel. The original scheme relied heavily on a concrete segmental deck for the main span. The revised scheme used a composite steel and concrete system, a concrete deck that provides compression capacity and durability in service, and a composite action between them once the bridge is closed. Paired with revised pylon geometry and more conservative reinforcement through the kinked regions, that change simplified the force flow from stay to deck to tower and improved the control of deflection and vibration as the deck grew outward. But why does steel help during erection? It's all about stiffness per unit weight. In a half-built configuration, a lighter, stiffer segment behaves better in gusty conditions and gives the construction engineer more breathing room when deciding whether to lift or to hold. Combine that with clearer anchorage details and you have a system whose temporary and permanent states are both easier to predict. Current public guidance targets the first bridge opening around the end of 2025 and the second span in 2027 or 2028. But I can say from seeing the site in person in mid-2025, there is almost no chance the first span will be done by the end of the year. And in terms of cost, as of today, the total will be around $1.45 billion. Removing in-channel piers takes targets away from ships, and this really matters in a post-Francis Scott Key bridge disaster world. But the idea of removing piers and increasing clearances aren't unique to Houston. They echo decisions made elsewhere after hard moments, perhaps most famously in Tampa Bay, when Florida replaced the Sunshine Skyway with a cable-stayed span that raised clearances and added serious pier protection after a freighter strike in 1980. For drivers, the long-term benefit should be substantial. Four lanes in each direction with full shoulders is not just decreased congestion, but is also great for traffic management in the event of construction or an accident. The shared use path along the east side may be a small line item in a billion dollar program, but it's a sensible way to give people on foot or bikes a safe, high quality crossing that has long been a wall for anyone not in a car. To be clear, the 2020 findings didn't prove the building would have collapsed. Was it at a higher risk of something like this happening? Yes, but by no means would that have occurred. Left unaddressed, that kind of uncertainty narrows safety buffers, complicates staging, and can chip away at a structure's intended 100 plus year life. Fixing it midstream carried real consequences. Hundreds of millions in additional public dollars, a schedule pushed back by years, and further damage to the reputation of a firm already under scrutiny. The lesson is that good engineering up front, conservative details, and selecting a design team with a track record of rigorous peer review are the most effective ways to buy safety, durability, and inspectability for the next century. If there's inspiration here, it's the quiet pride that comes from asking hard questions and choosing verification over speed. The measure of success won't be ribbon cutting. It'll be tankers moving under a peer-free opening without hesitation, commuters crossing a deck that feels planted even in a heavy crosswind, and a project that most people stop talking about because it just works. After all, in infrastructure, that's often the point. At BuildCore, we're building America, one story at a time. We cover some of the most impressive and headline-grabbing projects and topics across this great country. And with your help, the channel has grown to over 50,000 subscribers and reached over 10 million people. With that being said, thank you, and I'll see you next time.